Hello, this is hepatitis B and D virology tutorial presented by the essential review, also called as above that with reference, living cut illustrated review of microbiology by Cynthia Cornelius and Bruce Fisher and Richard Harvey. So here we are going to visualize um, hepatitis D and E. <coughs> so you need to know that all those are RNA viruses and on RNA viruses you have single stranded, double stranded. In single stranded you can have now classified into positive strand and negative strand. Positive strand generally means that it is from 5 prime to 3 prime direction. And then when it is entering when it's entering the uh, the cytoplasm of the host cell, it can directly do translation without having to replicate the RNA. Now, positive strand can be divided into non-envelope and envelope. To understand positive strand better, put a pause and go back to our initial videos on the introduction of virology. So, um, no, so positive strand can be divided into non-envelope and envelope. And now, the non-envelope is usually equosahedral, and the envelope can be equosahedral or helical. So, non-envelope equosahedral. So on that non-envelope equals a HR, you can have the Kali, the Kali CVKD for the subfamily, which consists of hepatitis E. The non-envelope equals a HR can consist of the Picona VGD subfamily, so fam um, the Picona VGD family, sorry, the Picona VGD family, which consists of hepatitis D, and it also consists of hepatitis a, hepatitis A and D are, are in here. Uh, no, they consist of hepatitis E and A. Sorry. Now the next is under the envelope. Under the, the envelope equals the H. You have the flavin VD, which is hepatitis C. So hepatitis A, E and C are all uh, 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 RNA viruses with D. Is it clear? So hepatitis A, E and C. Are all RNA viruses with hepatitis D, which is also inside the picona virus? <coughs> now, the only one which is um, a DNA virus is hepatitis B, and hepatitis B is a double stranded envelope virus. It's a double stranded envelope virus in the a HEPA, the HEPANA VVD family. You have hepatitis B. So that's the classification. All these are hepatitis are um, are um, RNA viruses. Physically, so this one, the only one which is enveloped is hepatitis C. Physically, the two which are so hepatitis B and C are all enveloped, while the rest are non envelope um, equals a hydra. But the shape of all them or all of them is equals a hydra. <clears throat> now, what is the mode of transmission? Now, based on the mode of transmission, you know that fecal oral is the mode of transmission of hepatitis A and hepatitis E. Is it clear? While the injection, sexual contact, heterosexual, homosexual, and all that is mostly for hepatitis B, C, and E. And now you need to know that hepatitis D is only going to cause acute infection, but B and C are the ones that are capable of causing chronic infection. And then you need to know that the combination of B and D is going to cause a fulminant hepatitis. Hepatitis, so we have the definition of fulminant hepatitis, which is in the presence of hepatic symptoms and the presence of, um, um, uh, of hepatic en encephalopathy and liver failure in a patient that was initially normal for less than, um, for a the patient that was initially not asymptomatic. Basically, so the, pres the, patient, the presence of liver failure and hepatic encephalopathy in a patient that was initially normal in a period of less than two weeks. Basically, that's what is called formula hepatitis. <coughs> This is an electron micrograph to show the serum of a patient with severe hepatitis. Here you can visualize incomplete particles, you can see viral particles. Now, this um, is going to be the replication of hepatitis B virus. So, how does hepatitis B virus replicate? Now, you need to know that hepatitis B virus is, an, is a DNA virus and then it is circular, circular DNA. Basically. So we have two main parts of DNA. You can have the 
plus stranded DNA and we have the minus stranded DNA. The plus stranded DNA is inside, the minus stranded DNA is outside. Is it clear? Now, we need to know that what, as I've already said, for the DNA, the plus stranded DNA is going to be from 3' prime to 5' prime direction. So, in order for you to understand this better, go back on the introduction of virology. Now, for the plus stranded DNA, we said that it is from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. And from the minus strand DNA, we said that it's from the 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Now, we need to know that what generally this is the diagram of a hepatitis B virus. And now, inside you're going to have the plus stranded DNA, and outside you're going to have a minus strand DNA. We need to know that in order for you to replicate this form of DNA, you're mostly going to replicate from outside to inside. So let's going to let's see what you can to visualize. So you're going to have viral DNA is going to move to the nucleus. So it's going to enter the nucleus where the short plus short DNA of the virus genome is going to be extended, and the minus is going to be repaired, forming the closed circular DNA. So at first it is like this, you have short and you have long, and all of them are not repaired. So it's going to enter the nucleus and it's going to be repaired to be complete. Is it clear? Then later on you're going to have transcription by the host RNA polymerase 2 to produce 4 RNA. So you're going to have transcription to produce 4 RNA. <clears throat> and one is genomic size that serve as an MRA and a template for the DNA synthesis. So one of them. So all of, most of them are going to enter here in order to produce the D different viral proteins. And one of them is going to transcribe the RNA. So one of them is going to be an RNA dependent DNA polymerase template. Is it clear for the production of DNA? So this one is going to, to be used in the transcription of DNA. And now, and, and, and on C this molecule still, you can have also a reverse transcription where, um, so that is going to control the complementary DNA pair. Is it clear? So one is going to be here, this is still a reverse transcriptase that is going to form this. And then this is also another reverse transcriptase that is going to produce the negative strand template. And all that is going to fuse together with the viral protein to produce the nuclear capsule that is going to be enclosed and enveloped out of the cell. So I'm going to move out of the cell as such there. <coughs> Now, what is the clinical outcome of hepatitis A of hepatitis B? So, this is the case of acute hepatitis B. In acute hepatitis B, the outcome is A. You can have more virulent of viruses, is it clear? Or you can have co-infection with other viruses, or you can have uncontrolled cytokine activity. Is it clear? All that is going to result to fulminant hepatitis. So, if you have co-infection of viruses, mostly like with the infection with um, if you have infection with uh, um, hepatitis C, hepatitis D, you can have fulminant hepatitis, that's a co-infection. If you have more virulent strain of hepatitis B virus, you can result also to fulminant hepatitis. If you have uncontrolled cytokine activity, so it means that the cytokines are released anyhow in the body, you can also have fulminant hepatitis. So those are the three cases. In the form of hepatitis. The second case is if you have limited cell mediated and humoral response, is it clear? It can produce chronic hepatitis. Is it clear? If you have limited cell mediated and humoral response, it can produce chronic hepatitis. Now, chronic hepatitis can be divided into three. <coughs> it can be divided into severe chronic hepatitis. Is it clear? In chronic active hepatitis, so this is it can be divided into severe chronic hepatitis. It can be divided into severe chronic hepatitis in chronic active hepatitis, where you can have a patient having cirrhosis and hepatocellular. It can result to cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. You can have a minimal chronic hepatitis in chronic persistent hepatitis. So in this case, it's not active. Is it in chronic and active hepatitis, the question that you want to ask me is how do you identify chronic hepatitis? To identify chronic hepatitis, you use immunoglobulin G. Is it clear? So use the immunoglobulin G. Now the question that you want to ask me is which particular immunoglobulin G you use in 
hepatitis B. Now we need to know that hepatitis B, we have not set all the different antigens that are on, on the, the capsule of hepatitis B. Is it clear? Hepatitis B have different antigens. We need to know that it has a S antigen, which is the surface antigen. It has a C antigen, which is the core antigen. It has the E antigen, which is the envelope antigen. Is it clear? Now, the surface antigen is to show if there is hepatitis or not. Is it clear? The surface antigen is to show if there is hepatitis or not. So, if there is the presence of the hepatitis B surface antigen, it means that you have hepatitis. If there is no presence of hepatitis B antigen, it means that you have no hepatitis. Is it clear? As easy as that. Now, the core antigen is usually not present in blood, but the core antibody is what is going to help you to know if it is a is chronic or acute. So, for a chronic hepatitis, you are going to have um, so for, for a chronic hepatitis, you are going to have a high level of the total core antibody. Is it clear? So, if you have a high level of the total core antibody, immunoglobulin, it means that the total for the total core, if you have the high level of immunoglobulin G of total core antibody, it means that it's a chronic hepatitis. Is it clear? So, for as you know that it is a chronic hepatitis, you can use the core or an acute hepatitis, you can use a core anti antigen or antibody so in order for you to know if it is a it's a it's an it's an accurate hepatitis the immunoglobulin's m of the core antibody is going to be high is not in order for you to know that it's a chronic hepatitis the immunoglobulin g of the total core antibody is going to be high is it clear? as easy as that now in order for you to know the infectivity the the probability for a patient to be highly infectious or lowly infectious use the E antigen. Is it clear? So the envelope antigen can help you to know if a patient is going to be highly infective or not. So if somebody has high level of envelope antigen, means that it can easily spread the infection to other people. Is it clear? But if the patient has low level of envelope antigen, means that it cannot spread the infection to other people. So as this as it's a very it's a very good test to know if a woman is going to breastfeed a child or not. You can use the hepatitis E antigen level in blood. So if it's high, she does not have to breastfeed the child. If it is low, she can breastfeed the child after the child has taken the normal vaccine, um, the immunoglobulin two days after uh, um, um, after the day, after birth, and he has also given be given the vaccine two weeks after birth. Is it clear? So if all those procedures have been given, then she can give her the, her breastfeed her breast milk to the child. Now, in order for you to know that it is an active hepatitis or it is an inactive hepatitis, you have to see the levels of the transaminases. If the transaminases, that is uh, ASAD, that is uh, aspartic aminotransferase and, and, and alanine aminotransferase are high, it means that it is active hepatitis. But if they are low, it means that it is an inactive hepatitis. So in this case, you can have chronic persistent hepatitis or you can have also a symptomatic carrier state. <clears throat> now the other, you have effective cell mediated and if you have now effective cell mediated uh, immune response, you are going to have resolution. Now these are the <clears throat> symptoms of acute hepatitis. So the symptoms of acute hepatitis from the different period. You need to know that based on the period of acute hepatitis, you can have the incubation period of acute hepatitis. You can have the pre-icteric period when um, the icteria has not icteria has not occurred. It means that jaundice has not occurred. You have the icteric period and you have the convalescent period. <coughs> All these are the period of acute hepatitis. Is it clear? So for incubation period from time of exposure to the period in the period period you can have malaise you can have anorexia you can have just nose and you can have quite upper quadrant pain but now generally what there is that there is uh, there is, um, there is um, hepatitis is the period period where the patients start having jaundice and having dark urine the dark urine here is not because of hematuria because of not because of hematuria but instead because um, the bilirubin urine is going to be produced in the case of hepatitis is going to be conjugated bilirubin is it clear? so the bilirubin is going to be produced in the level of hepatitis is going to be high level of conjugated bilirubin and that conjugated bilirubin can be passed into urine is it clear? so when it passes into urine it's going to make the urine to be darkish in color 
generally you have to know that um, when you have hepatitis it is going to affect the the excretory function of the liver so the liver is not going to excrete well conjugated bilirubin now in the by the in the body the biliary system so the the conjugated bilirubin is going to accumulate in the blood and is going to be released via urine to make the urine to be dark in color and then later on you are going to have the convalescent period <clears throat> the convalescent period is a period of recovery all this is in acute hepatitis now these are the different immunoglobulins now as i was telling you based on the the acute hepatitis or, or chronic hepatitis so you said that you, you need to know that what well, are three main antigen in hepatitis you have hepatitis b surface antigen you have the envelope antigen and you have also the core antigen those are the three main hepatitis that you have to know now <clears throat> This is the in the case. So we start. So we have we need to know that what at the at first. This is this is the time all through. Generally, we need to know that acute hepatitis is less than six months. When you say acute hepatitis, is going to become you consider it as less than six months. And when you say chronic hepatitis, you consider it as greater than six months. So acute infection, we can have viral DNA. So the generalities here, you have viral DNA, you have viral shedding, you have elevated liver enzymes, you have the symptoms and you have jaundice. Is it clear? Now at the beginning, we need to know that well, at the beginning, the early phase, you have anti-hepatitis B called antigen appear in early clinical phase. Is it clear? So at the beginning, you have the core antigen that is going to be present. The core antigen is just like the capsid antigen. Is it clear? C is for the core or C is still for the capsid. So when the capsid of the hepatitis is present inside blood, is it clear? So you are going to see, so immediately it's present inside the blood, immediately the antibody is going to be produced again. Is it clear? So you have anti, so, so when the core antigen is going to be present, you have immediately anti-core. So when you are infected, you're going to have anti-core antigen appear in early phase of, in the clinical, phase is it clear then later on during the incubation period hepatitis b surface antigen and hepatitis e are first indicator of hepatitis b infection to appear in blood is it clear so when the patient is infected is it clear the core antigen has even no time to be seen the first one which are even going to be seen are hepatitis e and hepatitis b surface antigen is it clear? And hepatitis E surface antigen, the first the first to be seen is supposed to be hepatitis B core antigen. But hepatitis B core antigen is so minimal that they cannot be detected with clinical testing. So what is going to be detected is even the hepatitis B core antibody. The, the first the immunoglobulin is GM of the hepatitis B core antibody. So this so that's why you have anti-hepatitis B core antibodies is it clear then later on you're going to see the hepatitis b um, envelope antigen then later on you're going to see the hepatitis b surface antigen is it clear now the next you see that at so this so later on you're going to see hepatitis b surface antigen now when you start seeing the hepatitis b surface antigen it's at that same period of time that you start seeing the anti-hepatitis B envelope antigen. Is it clear? So at the same period of time that you start seeing the hepatitis B surface antigen, the hepatitis E antigen is first seen before the hepatitis B surface antigen. But when you start seeing the hepatitis B surface antigen, that's the time that the, the, the anti-hepatitis E envelope antigen is going to be seen. Anti hepatitis E anti uh, antibody is the antibody that acts against hepatitis B antigen. Anti hepatitis B core antibody is the antibody that acts against hepatitis B core antigen. So that's the same time that is going to be seen here. So you see the antibodies of anti um, anti hepatitis B antigen appear early in clinical phase. Then later on, the anti hepatitis B surface antigen antibodies are going to appear. So you are going to have first this is going to appear. Is it clear? 
Now, here you still have so you still have the anti hepatitis B um, core antibodies that are going to be present here. Is it clear? So you still have the anti hepatitis B core antibody. Now, there's a certain period that is shown here, and that period, so in some individual in acute infection of hepatitis, the hepatitis B surface antigen become undetectable. Basically, before the anti hepatitis B surface antigen appear, basically, so there are certain people who are infected, but the hepatitis B surface antigen is not seen. So that's the period you see from year to year, and the anti hepatitis um, B uh, um, surface antigen, the period between the the, 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 the period where hepatitis B surface antigen is not seen and the anti-hepatitis and the beginning from which you start seeing the anti-hepatitis B surface antibody that period is inside here and this period is called the window period and in the window period you cannot detect if a patient is actually having hepatitis B or the patient has resolved from hepatitis B you need to know that what when some when you see you the anti hepatitis B surface antigen in blood, it means that the patient is treated with hepatitis. Is it clear? So in patient who when you have high level of anti hepatitis B surface antigen in the body, it means that the patient has been infected with hepatitis or he has been vaccinated with the hepatitis vaccine and he has been he's completely immune against hepatitis. Is it clear? So when you see that it means that the patient is immune. <coughs> But you see, you need to know that the envelope antibodies continuously be to the risk, continuously produced, and this envelope antibody prevent the patient from having um, infectivity. Basically, now this is the core. The core, you see, needs to know that the core is continuously produced. It means that at the beginning here, you have the immunoglobulins M of the core antibody, and then later on, you are going to have the immunoglobulins G. Of the core antibody, is it clear? So this is the these are the immunoglobulins G of the core antibody. Now when you do immunoglobulins M of the core antibody and the immunoglobulins G of the core antibody, all that together is going to produce what is going to produce the total core antibody, is it clear? So in those patients in whom the infection is resolved completely, you are going to have a high level of the anti. Uh, um, in, so when you have complete resolution of the disease, you are going to have high level anti um, 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 anti hepatitis B surface anti anti uh, antigen, the anti hepatitis B core antigen, and the anti hepatitis B and uh, anti hepatitis um, B surface antigen antibodies are going to be present for life and they are going to be very high. Is it clear? So those are the two that are going to be very high. So the anti hepatitis so if the anti hepatitis B surface antibody is extremely high, with the anti hepatitis B core antibody still high, you are going to it's just going to tell you that there is high resolution. But I don't want you not to forget about this window period because this window period is a time where you can lose the detection of certain people. Certain people can be in existing in this period where they don't have the hepatitis B surface antigen, so you cannot say that they are infected. And they are also not having the anti-hepatitis B surface antigen. But in this window period, what is going to tell you that the patient is having, may have encountered hepatitis before, is the, the, um, is, um, the, the anti hepatitis B, the anti hepatitis B core anti antibodies and the anti hepatitis B envelope antibodies. You see that by that window period, though you don't see hepatitis B surface antigen, you are still going to see these two antigen, but it may make you think that the patient is not infected. The patient is still infected in that case. You may not see the hepatitis B surface antigen, but if you don't see yet the, the anti hepatitis B surface antibody, that patient is still at high risk of having hepatitis. So that's the window period. <coughs> now, the next one, and the window period, as you can see here, can be a period from, um, from of one to two days, one to three days, even like that. One to three months, sorry. So because it's not in exposure. So it is, let's say, one month one to three months in time 
So um, now, in the case of chronic infection, that was the case of an acute infection. In the case of a chronic infection, you can have elevated liver enzyme, as I've said, it shows the activity of the disease. Now, for the, the chronic infection, now you need to know that what you need to know that you still have the hepatitis B, um, the hepatitis B envelope antigen, you have the hepatitis B surface antigen. Is it clear? So for chronic infection, you see that the hepatitis B surface antigen is always present. It's just to tell you that the, the patient is still infected with hepatitis. When you see the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen, just know that the patient has hepatitis as easy as that. Now, when you see now the immunoglobulins, the immunoglobulins that appear after the hepatitis B surface antigen are the IgG, they are the immunoglobulins G of the total core antibodies, while the immunoglobulins that appear before are the IgM. So when you see that the IgG are still high and they still the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen, just know it's a chronic infection. Now, in this diagram, they have not shown you the activity of the infection. For you to know that the, the infection is active, it means that there is going to be a high level of the uh, aminases, like the acid and alat are going to be very high, aspartate and aminotransferase and alanine and aminotransferase are going to be very high in a patient that is going to have an active, um, is going to have an active hepatitis. Is it clear? Now, so those are the cases. Now, in case where you want to know that there is a hepatitis with liver failure, if, there is, if you want to know that there is hepatitis with liver failure, then the patient is going to have symptoms like jaundice. Because there are certain hepatitis where the liver may not fail, the liver is normal. In liver failure, the liver is not functioning with the normal metabolic requirements. Is it clear? So if you want to know that there is hepatitis with liver failure, then you are going to now look for the liver function test. Just like example, you are going to look for bilirubin level, you are going to look for the, the uh, albumin level, and you are going to look for um, <clears throat> the, the, the next one, which is the, the clotting time, like the prothrombin time and the plasma thromboplastin time. Is it clear? So those are the how to detect the different cases of hepatitis. Now this is this is the interpretation. So how do you interpret? So if you have hepatitis B envelope antigen, is it clear? So you have hepatitis B envelope antigen, you have hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-hepatitis B core antibodies and anti-hepatitis B surface antibody. Now <clears throat> let's start interpreting. So here the absence, so the absence of anti-hepatitis B substance is an indication that the infection has, has become chronic. So if you don't see the anti-hepatitis B surface antigen in blood, as you can see here, you can see the anti-hepatitis E, you can see all of that, you still see the presence of anti-hepatitis B surface antigen, but you don't see the presence of anti-hepatitis B surface antigen, it means that this is a chronic infection, you see, the hepatitis E is present, it means that the patient is infective, is infectious, it can transmit disease to other people. Hepatitis S is still present, hepatitis B surface anti is still present, it means that the patient is still having hepatitis B, and the anti hepatitis B core antibody is still present, it means that the patient is having immunoglobulins that is chronic. Then you don't see any anti hepatitis B surface antigen, meaning that the patient is actually having an unresolved. Because if you don't see anti hepatitis B surface antigen, meaning that it's unresolved, you have an unresolved chronic hepatitis. Is it clear? But now, if you see all of these are negative, but the patient has anti hepatitis B surface antigen, meaning that the patient has been vaccinated against. A hepatitis. If you see anti, this is negative. This is negative means that the patient does not have hepatitis and is not infectious. And the patient has anti-hepatitis B core antibody, and the patient has this means that the patient has been pre, um, infected in the past, and then he has resolved. Is it clear? So those are the different cases in a one-year interval. Generally, you need to know that they resolve acute hepatitis occur less than six months why it becomes chronic hepatitis when it is more than six months so now this is in effect of patients or uh, the patient age or the tendency of acute hepatitis virus so you need to know that so when you have 
patients of 0 to 20 years generally this um, so this is the percentage is it clear of the different patients so infected children age five years um, or less is going to be 25 to 50 percent but now infant born to infected mothers you have 90 percent of patients is it clear why infected adults is only five percent <clears throat> Now, these are the drugs now for the treatment of hepatitis B. So what are the drugs? We start, we can have interferons and we can have pigilated interferons. So here, yeah, they are not very used because they have many side effects, but there is no drug resistance. It's administered subcutaneously, but it has also a high cost. Pigilated interferons, a long acting interferon taken once a week to give for one year so we take once a week for one year and it's highly costly many side effects but the best thing is that it has no drug resistance so this is in contrast to the other hepatitis treatment which has to be given by mouth for many years until the side response is achieved so that is for interferons provided that the patient is having chronic hepatitis so in patient having chronic can use interferons another one where you can use is lamivudine so lamivudine is high rate of drug resistance it has a low cost many years of experience to confirm the safety including the use in drug in, in doing pregnancy now we have adefovi can also be used it's a potent but the potential problem is that it is just like tenofovi it is potentially nephrotoxic it has a pro having the problem to a kidney you have also activity against lamivudine and resistance to hepatitis b virus and tkv it's having a high cost has a has potent antiviral activity we have tell b vudine a high rate of drug resistance role as primary therapy is limited and then you have tenofovi high has a high nephrotoxicity toxicity first line treatment in the naive patients when a patient that has been encountered has encountered hiv for the first um, um, hepatitis b for the first time you can use it and in patients with lamivudine telbivudine and all that are uh, proficient at the added therapy <coughs> Now, routine immunization. Generally, you need to know that immunized patients are in from childhood. Is it clear? All infants and previously unvaccinated by age of 11, you have to immunize them. So, you have increases of hepatitis B is occurring in patients with multiple sexual partners. Sexual partner and household contact with hepatitis B positive patient, men who have sex with men. We have using illicit drugs and all that, so all this can occur in the risk, increase the risk factor of hepatitis B infection. Now, hepatitis B surface antigen is supplied by co infection hepatitis B with hepatitis D. So, if you have hepatitis B and you have hepatitis D, hepatitis D increases the virulence of hepatitis B. But you need to know that hepatitis D cannot infect a cell if hepatitis B is not present. Is it so this is an example of a structure of hepatitis D. So you see hepatitis D. So hepatitis D which is also has it has the delta antigen complex with it has a delta antigen which is complex with the RNA genome. It has an envelope protein which is present there. But you need to know that hepatitis D is never going to infect any person if there is no hepatitis B. So we have simultaneous. So if you have simultaneous primary infection, hepatitis D and hepatitis B, you have incubation going to result to an acute disease. Now in chronic co-infection, hepatitis B, hepatitis D and hepatitis B incubation, simultaneous primary co-infection is going to cause acute disease. Now incubation again is going to cause chronic disease. Now, in case of primary hepatitis D infection of a chronically, this is in a case of a chronic co-infection. So the first case in a case of primary co-infection, if you have um, a patient having hepatitis, so it's a primary co-infection, means that you have hepatitis B and hepatitis D at the same time, you are going to have an acute disease after the incubation period. If you have a chronic infection, is it clear? It means that it's a simultaneous primary co-infection. So if you have a chronic co-infection, it means that you have hepatitis D, hepatitis B chronically, simultaneously, you're going to have a chronic disease. But if you have a primary hepatitis D on a patient who is chronically hepatitis B, 
what is going to have is view is that a patient that is already chronically hepatitis B, you have hepatitis D on on, on him. You are going to have is that's the case where you have is so a fulminant hepatitis. It's in that case that you can see a fulminant hepatitis. But if it is primary infection of both of the zone is going to result acute disease, and if it's a chronic infection of both of the zone is going to result to a chronic disease. But if you have a patient that has hepatitis D, or the patient who is already chronically infected with hepatitis B, that's when you have a, a, a fulminant, an acute fulminant hepatitis. So from here, we've seen that we have finished with the tutorial on hepatitis B and hepatitis D. And we say thanks for your kind attention. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.